alaikum everybody. Welcome to the Islamic family, the Islamic Society Leading American Muslims. And I always like to remind you that we were established and organized to be an organization that would invite and empower uh, Muslims, whether they were born into a Muslim family or where they navigated this way, they reverted. Um, and we want to continue to always be encouraging uh, a positive influence in people's lives in their move toward uh, worshiping as though we see Allah in everything that we say and do, inshallah. So in alhamdulillah, na'hmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina may yahdih lahu fala mudillallah wa may yu'lil fala hadiyallah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasooluh Indeed, all the praise is due to Allah. We praise Allah, we seek Allah's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our soul and from our sinful deeds. Whoever Allah guides, they will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity, but Allah, as of Ajal, the one having no partners, and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's final messenger. Ya ayyuhal adina amanu taqullaha haqatu katihi walla tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O you who have believed, fear Allah as Allah alone should be feared. And die not, except as Muslims in submission to Allah. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum aladhi khalaka kum min nafsi wahidah wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha min huma rijalan kathira wa nasa'a wa taku Allah aladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba O people be dutiful to your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women and fear Allah through whom you demand mutual rights and revere the wounds that bore you. Indeed, Allah is ever over you, an observer. Ya ayyuhal adina amanu taqullaha wa kulu kaulan sadida yusli likum amalikum wa yaqfir likum dhanubukum wa may yuti'illaha wa rasulahu fawqad fawza fawzan adhima O you who have believed fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice Allah will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sin and whoever obeys Allah and Allah's messenger has certainly attained the greatest achievement I'm about so today, my beloved family, I promised you that I would address something that has a lot of hidden gems in it, a lot of benefits, a lot of importance, and a lot of virtues. And so for those of you who are a little surprised by this subject and find that you're already doing this, it will be a reminder of those gems, benefits, importance, and virtue to Allah and to your life on this life and in the hereafter, inshallah. And so the subject that I want to talk about, and I pray that Allah will open our hearts, that Allah will prepare our hearts to receive this lesson and to really, really sponge, like a sponge, absorb the value of this lesson. Not long ago, I was doing some research and it was Pew Research. They're a very um, respected research firm and they do a lot of research around religious issues. And uh, it turns out that only maybe 50% of the Muslims pray five times a day. And specifically the research indicated that very few people get up for Fajr. And I know for many of us, waking up for Fajr can be difficult and burdensome. However, 
the only reason we would not do it is that we do not know the virtues in it. No one will miss out on these opportunities except by not knowing and realizing its value and virtue in the eyes of Allah as a wajal, Allah's messenger, angels, and its benefits to you in this life, the grave, and the hereafter. It is proven in the Quran and Sunnah that when a person dies, he or she will be called to account for every major and minor action he or she did in this world, whether it was good or bad. He or she will be rewarded for his or her good deeds and punished for his or her evil deeds. These actions are witnessed on the earth, and the first stage of that reckoning is in the grave. In the grave, the first thing a person will be asked will be, who was your Lord? What was your religion? Who is this man who was sent among you? As was narrated in the Hadith of Bara'a ibn Azib, may Allah be pleased with him, which was narrated by Abu Dawood in his Sunnan and classified as a Sahih, a sound ahadith by Al Albani in Sahih Abi Dawood. On the day of resurrection, we will be brought to account for every major and minor action, even though we have already been brought to account for that in the grave. This is what is very important, my beloved brothers and sisters, the first thing we will be brought to account for on the day of resurrection will be our obligatory prayers. Five of them prayed on time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described daily, monthly, and annual events of importance. And what's very interesting is that many people will not miss the monthly event of Ramadan, but they will miss the daily event of Salah five times a day. So Allah described daily, monthly, and annual events of importance, prayer daily, fasting one month, four sacred months, Hajj, and Zakat annually. Different times carry different values for our Lord, and for us. Abu Huraira narrated, radiallahu on, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the first thing among their deeds for which the people will be brought to account on the day of resurrection will be salat, prayer. Our Lord will say to his or her angels, Although Allah knows best, look at my slave's prayer. Is it complete? Is it being prayed with the right conditions? Is it being prayed with Teshua? Or is it lacking? If it is complete, performed correctly with no resentment, it will be recorded as complete. And he or she will be saved. But if it is lacking in any way, if it has a default in any way, Allah will say, look and see whether my slave did any voluntary, nafal, sunnah prayers. If he or she had done voluntary prayers, Allah as a wajal would say, complete the obligatory prayers by my slave from his or her voluntary prayers. So my beloved brothers and sisters, your voluntary prayers will be a substitute for those other prayers on the day of resurrection. This is the mercy of Allah. Then the rest of his or her deeds will be examined similarly. Based on the fard first, and this is narrated by Abu Dawood. On the day of resurrection, people will be asked about other matters, including the following. Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet 
said the son and daughters of Adam will not be dismissed from before their Lord on the day of resurrection until he or she has been questioned about five things. His or her life and how he or she spent it. And so sometimes people tell me, be careful, Imam Sykes, don't do too much. And I know that I'm going to be given account. So I know my body has rights and I reserve that. I respect that and I give it that. But I can never do too much because I can never compete with what Allah has done for me. But we will be asked about five things, his or her life and how he or she spent it, his or her youth. And that's prior to 40 years of age and how he or she used it. His and her wealth and how they earned it and how they disposed of it and how he or she acted upon what he or she acquired of knowledge. So when we have knowledge and we do not implement it and we all have a knowledge that there are five daily prayers, then we will be held account for having knowledge that we in fact did not implement. So there are 10 hidden gems that I want to share with you today of Salah, particularly the Salah of Fajr. And the first gem that I want you to hear and know and remember every time you think you can't get up in the morning is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore by Fajr as Muslims we cannot take oaths by anyone other than Allah. But Allah, the majestic, can take oaths by anything Allah wishes. So in Surah 89, Surah Fajr, it's actually a surah named Fajr. This is how important it is. The 89th chapter of the Quran, Allah begins the surah by swearing upon the dawn, swearing upon Fajr. Wal Fajr, by the dawn. And every oath made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran emphasizes its importance. When Allah swears by something, it's like a red flag, an orange flag should get our attention. And likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stresses the time of Fajr. The second virtue is that the two sunan. The two sunnahs, the two sunnah raqqa or raqqa of Fajr prayer are better than the entire world and whatever is in it. Listen to that, folks. The two sunnahs before the Fajr prayer are better than the entire world and whatever is in it. In the hadith of Aisha, radi Allah on whom? The Prophet Sallallahu said, to raqqaq of prayer before the Fajr far, the prayer are better than the world and whatever is in it. And this is Sahih Muslim, book six, hadith number 118. So here we cannot miss something that is better than the whole world spiritually and everything in it. For this reason, there are no other there are no other sunnah prayer emphasized more by our prophet than these two rakhah before the Fajr prayer. Our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam always prayed these two rakhah, sunnah prayers of Fajr and never missed them. And this is found in Sahih Bukhari book 19, Hadith 19 including traveling, even though the concession was there to cut the sunnah prayer, the Prophet ﷺ never missed this sunnah prayer. Only an unwise person, and some scholars use the word here fool, would squander away the merits of performing a mere two units of prayer in light of this hadith alone. If this is the value and worth of the sunnah, raqqa, then what is the value of those that are obligatory? 
As humanity, we must not let our entire existence revolve around how to acquire all the treasures of the world. The third gem, whoever prays the Fajr prayer comes under the protection of Allah for the whole day. In other words, it is an insurance policy. In the Hadith, reported by Jundub ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet وسلم, said, he or she who performs the Fajr will be under the protection of Allah. And this is Sahih Muslim, Book 5, Hadith number 329. One who offers Fajr prayer is directly under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever prays the Fajr prayer, he or she is under Allah's protection. So be aware, O son or daughter of Adam, that Allah does not call you to account for being absent from Allah's protection for any reason. This is a warning about the important, my beloved brothers and sisters, of this prayer. And this is found in Sahih Muslim. So again, if you're already doing it, I want you to be reminded of the rewards that you may or you may not know. The previous hadith spoke about the merits of the two raka sunnah prayer of Fajr. And this hadith mentions the merits of praying the actual far, the actual obligatory Fajr prayer. For the one who offers the far, the Fajr prayer, Allah will protect them the whole day until the following Fajr prayer from harm. Fajr prayer also protects us from Satan. The Holy Prophet Wasallam said, whoever offers the morning prayer, he or she is under the protection of Allah the mighty and sublime. Glad tidings are always accompanied by warnings, especially someone fails to fulfill Allah's rights. The assurance of protection cannot be guaranteed to an obedient and disobedient slave of Allah equally. That would indeed be a grave injustice. And we know that Allah is the just. It is one thing to not awaken for Fajr despite one's best efforts, but it's another to not try at all to serve your master, to serve your Lord, your owner. How can we say we are slaves? Can you imagine being a slave and not getting up to go to work for your Lord? The Hadith above clarifies that praying Fajr is not an option, but an obligation that we owe to our Creator. A dire warning is ultimately given to the one who is neglectful of his or her foremost duties. Don't be swayed by the glitter and the glamour of this life. I fear my boss and maybe I'll be a little tired at work. So I'm more afraid of my boss, so I won't obey Allah and I won't pray, but I'm going to get up late so that I'm fresh at work. No, go to bed earlier and obey your Lord. The fourth virtue, recitation of the Quran at Fajr is witnessed by the angels. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in Surah Isra, Surah 17, verse 78, Establish prayer at the decline of the sun until the darkness of the night and recite the Quran at Fajr. Indeed, the recitation of Fajr is ever witnessed. Who witnessed it? The Messenger of Allah so solemn, recited this verse and recite the Quran during the Fajr. Verily, the recitation of the Quran during Fajr is ever witnessed. And he said, it is witnessed by the angels of night and the day. And this is Sunan Ibn Majah, Book 2, Hadith 4. Out of all the five obligatory prayers, our Prophet ﷺ emphasized, and he made the Fajr prayer the longest 
because he knew of its great virtue. It is reported that he would recite between 60 and 100 verses just for the fard of Fajr prayer. And this is in Sahih Bukhari, Book 9, Hadith 18. Apart from the four angels constantly with each human being, guarding and recording, other angels continually visit human beings. In his traditions, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminds his followers that angels are constantly visiting them. He said, angels come to you in succession by night and day, and all of them get together at the time of the Fajr, early morning, and Asr, afternoon prayers. Those who have passed the night with you or stayed with you ascend to heaven, and Allah, as I would tell, asks them, though Allah knows everything about you, in what state did you leave my slaves? The angels replied, we left them. They were praying, and we, re we reached them. They were praying. So when the angels changed shifts, they found us praying. When they changed shifts again, they found us praying. They gather to witness the prayer and listen to the recited verses of the Quran. Fajr prayer equates to positive energy and the presence of the Lord's angels. The fifth virtue that I want you to remember and know is remembering Allah after Fajr can earn you the reward of Hajj and Umrah. The reward of praying Fajr prayer is the greatest. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever prays the morning prayer in congregation then sits remembering Allah until the sun rises, then prays to Raqqa'at. Units of prayer has the reward like that of Hajj and Umrah. So those folks who really dedicate themselves um, and after the Fajr prayer, they sit and they recite Quran and they make dhikr until sunrise. And then after sunrise, they make Torah cause Allah has promised them a reward like Hajj and Umrah. The sixth virtue that I want us to be reminded of those of us who do this and those of us who need to be encouraged to do this is that it is light and guidance. It is the light of the sun that sustains all life on the planet. If we have a vitamin D deficiency as a humans, we can get a disease called rickets. So it is the light of the sun that sustains all life on the planet, enables and causes all things to grow and provides warmth and comfort, safety and security to humanity. Similarly, the Fajr prayer provides spiritual light and guidance, strength and support to the human soul and heart. So whilst the physical sun provides benefit to the physical body, the sun of Fajr, the sun of dawn, the rising of the light provides strength and support to the human soul and heart. Salah is the second pillar of Islam. Offering Salah five times a day is obligatory on every Muslim. Salah differentiates Muslims from people of other beliefs. And most importantly, it is a means of invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking Allah's pleasure. Number seven, the seventh virtue, the seventh gem. In the Holy Quran, Allah Almighty says, indeed, those who believe and do righteous deeds and establish prayer, establish prayer, establish prayer and give zakah will have their reward with their Lord and there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. So if you don't wanna have fear doubt, worry, and fear, and negative belief in your life, get up and pray your five prayers. Get up and pray your Fajr and pray your, your other prayers, the five prayers. 
the Fajr prayer, which is the first of the five daily prayers offered each day at dawn, is one of the prayers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the most. The time for the Fajr prayer is a time of light, a time of barakah and spiritual blessing. Fajr prayer time is a blessed time and one need not worry about losing sleep for with proper spiritual practice, the human body and mind becomes energized with life energy and force for the rest of the day. And you taste the sweetness of that alone time. If you think about it, the rest of the world is being lazy and sleeping. You're getting a jump start with your Lord. You're renewing your heart and soul. The eighth gem, those who offer Fajr and Maghrib prayer will not enter into hell. In this regard, one does not get expiated from hell by offering a single Fajr and Maghrib prayer. Instead, one needs to do it with consistency and in its window of time. There is Hadith related to this. Whoever performs the prayer before the rising of the sun and the prayer before its setting will not enter hell. And this is in Sahih Muslim. The ninth gem of this beautiful prayer. Muslims who pray dawn prayer will be admitted to paradise. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever offers the two prayers Asr and Fajr will enter paradise. Imagine that we didn't enter paradise because we didn't pray Fajr. And this is found in Bukhari. The 10th gem is that the Fajr prayer and the Salat five times a day defines belief from disbelief. There are many virtues of Fajr from its time to its recitation. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us realize the significance of these great prayers and motivate us to get up and offer them regularly. And so I want to do a review. I want to remind you of these 10 beautiful benefits of Fajr prayer and rejoicing messages for those who offer the obligatory Fajr prayer daily. Keep them in mind to achieve such great benefits and blessings both in this world and in the hereafter. We must implement what Allah orders us to do. We must believe, materialize, manifest, and realize it in action. Otherwise, it is just a belief not followed by a commitment and not followed by the promise and the oath that we made to Allah when we say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu rasulu. So let's just review. Number one, Allah swears an oath by Fajr in Surah 89, verse 1. The two Sunnah raqat of Fajr prayer are better than the entire world and everything in it. Who Ever praise the Fajr prayer comes under the protection of Allah for the whole day. The angels witness the recitation of the Quran at Fajr. Surah 17, 78 is the proof for that. Remembering Allah after Fajr can earn you the reward of Hajj and Umrah. Number six, Fajr is light and guidance. Number seven, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Surah al-Baqarah, Surah 2, verse 277. Number eight, those who offer Fajr and Maghrib prayer will not enter into hell. Number nine, whoever offers the two prayers, Asr and Fajr, will enter paradise. And number 10, it defines belief from disbelief. So praying Fajr is an essential part of our faith and the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every single morning of our life sets the tone and energy for the whole day and begins the day in the best possible way. Imagine that you are in sujood. Where else could you be that's better than that? 
There is nowhere that you could be better than in Sajud. Fajr prayer teaches us about the importance of time, that time is precious, and that we're going to give account for it. So we need to use it well and structure our day around the prayers, not the prayers around our day. The first thing that I do every morning is I take my appointments and I align them with my prayers. My wife builds my appointments so that there's time for me to pray. So we need to use it well and structure our day and make use of it. May Allah give us the strength to offer obligatory prayers regularly. The Fajr prayer is amongst the five daily prayers representing the second pillar of Islam, Salah. According to ahadith found in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, the performance of the Fajr dawn prayer alongside Asr can positively impact our lives as Muslims in the afterlife. The ahadith refers to them as the prayers of the cooler time. It is logical for Fajr prayer to influence our final outcome since it requires extra effort significantly. When the time of Fajr approaches, most of us are comfortably tucked into our beds. A Muslim has to overcome two opponents, the shaytan, the shaytan and their sleep to come to victory. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. According to Sunan Ibn Majah, the Prophet Sallallahu made dua for his ummah, asking Allah to bless the ummah in the early morning activities that they do. The message of Allah specifically, ask Allah to honor our morning and listen to this beautiful hadith. It was narrated from Sakar al ghamidi that the Messenger of Allah said, O oh Allah, bless my nation in the early mornings. Allah never turned away the supplicant, and He never turned away the Messenger of Allah's prayers. So Allah prayed for us, O oh Allah, bless my nation in their early mornings, what they do early in the morning. And this is Hassan. He said, when He sent out a raiding party or an army, he would send them at the beginning of the day. He said, Sakha was a man engaged in trade and he used to send his goods out at the beginning of the day and his wealth grew and increased. And we know there's a very wise saying that my grandfather used to say to me, the early bird gets the worm. I don't know if you like worms or not, but I certainly like the 10 benefits that I'm offered for Fajr. The reason why innumerable benefits of Fajr and the Sufa morning prayer have been reported is mainly owing to its timing. A devout Muslim, a devout Muslim who has prayed Fajr deserves all the countless bounties of Allah that lie in store for him or her that particular day. How can we lift our hands and ask Allah when Allah has asked us enjoined us and give us 10 benefits to pray Fajr and we don't even pray Fajr. Apple Quranic verses and Ahadith confirm this about Fajr. To start the day with an act of obedience can bring nothing but productivity and success in all endeavors. As a matter of fact, twice in the Adhan specific to Fajr, we say, As-salatu khairu min an-nom. As-salatu khairu min an -nom. Prayer is better than sleep. We are called, Hayya al-salah, hayya al-salah, hayya al-falah, hayya al-falah. Hasten to success, hasten to success, hasten to prayer, hasten to prayer. And I did that in reverse order. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cautions Allah's righteous slaves in Surah Al-Kaf that we read every Friday to remain patient by staying among people who call upon Allah in the morning and in the evening. He specifically says this in Surah Al-Kaf, striving for Allah's countenance. Allah tells us not to seek the dunya's adornment, the worldly life, and not to obey those whose hearts Allah has made unmindful of Allah's remembrance. 
who chase their lust, whelms, compulsion, compulsions, and desires, and their deeds are lost. The Fajra then includes that appropriate addition that I said before to inform us that prayer is superior to sleep. The Fajr prayer itself consists of two units of Sunnah and two units of Fard. No other Sunnah prayer is depicted as being better than the world and all that is in it. The Sunnah Rakat are meant to be brief. It is recommended to write, to recite Surah Kafirun in the first Rakat and Surah Ikhlas in the second. The two Fard Rakats were prolonged more than any other prayer by our beloved Prophet Let's create a strong morning routine for the sake of Allah that sets the tone for the rest of our day. O oh, you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance and glorify Allah's praises morning and evening. Surah 33, verse 41 and 42. Surah 13, verse 28, verily in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find peace? Some translations say the heart does not find rest except in the remembrance of Allah. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us to fulfill this beautiful duty. And then I wanted to speak to you about one other matter today um, that is very important and something that can cause us to lose our fast. And this is gossiping and being nosy. So I wanted to share with you um, some of the ahadith and the Quranic verses about this, because unfortunately, often when I do go to iftars, I hear people doing this and I think you've fasted all day and you've lost it. So when I talk about being nosy, I talk about being unduly curious about the affairs of others, prying, meddling into their business, informal prying and being overly inquisitive about people's lives, too interested in what other people are doing and wanting to discover too much about them. So modern day synonyms would be curious, inquisitive, prying and snoopy. One should always be mindful of not invading the personal space of others. And part of a person's being a good Muslim is leaving alone that which does not concern him or her. And this is in Tirmidhi, number 2318. In a nutshell, this particular hadith showcases the stance Islam has on the matter of being too inquisitive about the affairs of others. People generally tend to overstep their boundaries and do not adhere to certain social etiquettes that are pertinent for each and every Muslim to practice in their everyday life. And one of the questions, sadly, that I hear so often is people want to know what people did before they were a Muslim. And then all the people, they glorify the shaitan by emptying out all the sins that they did. We don't want to do that. We want to conceal that. What Allah has concealed, we do not reveal, and you will see later on unless there is benefit. All of us have heard someone or the other concerning a person with a myriad of questions like, when are you getting married? When are you having children? Um, how did you get divorced? Why are you getting divorced? All of these questions being overly inquisitive and concerning yourself with other people's private affairs is highly discouraged and looked down upon in Islam. A good Muslim does not interfere in matters that he or she have nothing to do with. It is a breach of privacy and makes the other person very uncomfortable. Our words fall under the category of our deeds and hold great weight in Islam. Hence, we must be conscious of the nature of the talk that we engage in. A person's tongue can be used to incur Allah Azza wa pleasure and Allah's wrath alike. 
such as the power of our words. And many of you might have heard me do speeches on oppressive word environments. Modern world today likes to argue that they're just four letter words. If you do not possess words that may contribute positively, it is better that you do not say anything. And the Prophet said that the greatest enemy by your is the two things by your side, speaking of the jaws because of the danger of the tongue and the thigh because of the danger of the private parts used illegally. According to a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu on, the Holy Prophet sallallahu said, whoever believes on Allah in the last day should speak what is good or keep silent. And this is in Sahih Bukhari. The Holy Prophet sallallahu encouraged his ummah to integrate noble manners and values associated with respect compassion, and modesty into their character. A Muslim should only take part in matters that directly affect him or her, nothing more. Only those deeds should be carried out which lead to something beneficial and constructive and refrain from those deeds which are irreverent or irrelevant and may cause harm to another person. Each and every one of us has our own set of faults and secrets that we do not wish the world to know. We want these secrets to be only between us and Allah as a wajal. Hence, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the concealer of our shortcomings and mistakes, why should we impose on others by prying into their private lives that have nothing to do with us? Prying usually leads to idle talk and assumptions jumping to conclusions, which may be completely false in reality. And the Holy Quran, Allah as a wajal, warns us against these petty behaviors. In Surah 49, verse 12, O oh, you who have believed, avoid much negative assumption, speculation. Indeed, some conjecture and assumption is actually a sin and do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother or sister when dead? You would detest it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the one who talks about people almost in any way, as I will continue to point out to you in the Hadith, that doesn't have a benefit, is accountable. It's like eating the dead flesh. And once there were two women, there's a Hadith about two women who fasted, but they gossiped during the day. And the Messenger of Allah, so we saw them, asked them to vomit into a hat. And then he pointed out that the flesh in the hat was the people that they had gossiped about. So if you want to lose your fast, these are things that will absolutely not only violate your fast, but violate your iman, violate your faith, and violate the very presence of Allah and the angels. Idle talk may also lead to the accumulation of envy and jealousy, which may end up harming both the individual who envies and the person who is being envied. Jealousy and envy are toxic states of being that lead to unhappiness and ungratefulness. We as Muslims must be good to one another and be a source of comfort for one another, not a source of pain or harm. I want for my brother or sister what I want for myself. Time and again, our Holy Prophet وسلم, instructed us to unite as one ummah and work towards building bonds of brother and sisterhood and companionship among ourselves. Abu Huraira narrated that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, be aware of suspicion, for suspicion is the worst of false tales, and do not look for the other's faults, and do not spy on one another, and do not practice 
and do not be jealous of one another and do not hate one another and do not desert, stop talking to one another. And oh, Allah's worshipers, be brothers and sisters to each other. This is found in Bukhari. Helping a fellow brother or sister or looking out for his or her wealth is not the same thing as being inquisitive. Islam does not discourage the act of aiding another. In fact, it endorses the notion at its very core. You may even offer advice to your fellow brothers or sisters as well if they require it. But be sure not to overstep your bounds and leave them without honor and leave them without dignity. Even the Prophet ﷺ said that if you take anything away from a marginalized group, I will testify against you on the day of judgment. So sometimes we have marginalized people and we find people propagating toward them microaggressions. We do not do that as Muslims. We are the doers of peace. Muslim, we are the doers of peace. At the end of the day, what matters is the intention behind the act. Sometimes though we de delude ourselves and say, well, my intention is good. And sometimes we'll be saying something and someone will say, oh, that's gossip. They say, but it's the truth. The Prophet said, even if it's the truth, we don't say anything about someone that would bother the other person to another person. So at the end of the day, what matters is the intention behind the act. That is the crux of the matter. So we must refrain from being too nosy about things that are of no concern to us. And instead, we must focus our energies on working toward earning the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world and in the hereafter. There are so many verses in the Quran that reject this act of spying and backbiting. In Surah 49 and 12, do not spy on each other behind their backs. In Surah 24, verses 27 to 28, do not enter other houses except yours without first asking permission. And if asked to go away, turn back for this is proper for you. So we don't get offended and all up in our egos. If we come to a Muslim brother's house, perhaps something is going on that he needs to take care of or sister. And they say, I'm sorry, it's not a good time for you to visit right now. In Surah An-Nisa, verse 58, and when you judge among the people, do so equitably. If you're in a position where you have to judge, you must judge equitably. It was also reported that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not go out and search for the fault of others. And this is Sunan al daud Imam Anawi said some of the scholars pointed out that spying means here seeking out the faults of other people, being critical, condemning, castigating, and indicting. It is also said that it means looking for secrets. And the word is mostly used in the sense of evil. The spy is the one who seeks out secrets for evil purposes. And the namus, is the one who seeks out secrets for good purposes. And it was suggested that, I'm sorry, it was said that they mean one and the same, which is seeking out information about people's state of affairs. So there is much to be said about this, many pages, many more ahadith, I just wanted to share this today because unfortunately there is more communal gathering and well, fortunately there's more communal gathering in the month of Ramadan and that is very good. The unfortunate part is what do we do in the communal gathering? Do we gather and praise Allah because Allah loves the houses where Allah's name is mentioned? Or do we gather and gossip? Do we gather and, and look at the world so I say this with love today, um, and I will share another hadith. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu narrated that Allah's Messenger وسلم, said a Muslim is a brother of another Muslim or a sister. 
so he or she should not oppress him, nor should he or she hand him over to an oppressor. Whoever fulfilled the needs of his brother or sister, Allah will fulfill his or her needs. Whoever brought his Muslim brother and sister out of a discomfort, Allah will bring him or her out of the discomfort on the day of resurrection. And whoever screened a Muslim, Allah as a wajel will screen him or her on the day of resurrection. So inshallah, make us to be Allah, those among those people who guard our tongues, who use our tongues, keep our tongues moist with your remembrance and not talking about other people, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.